The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon, uh, depending on your time zone, uh, for the North American Invasive Species Management Association webinar series. Uh, before we get started with DIA, I do want to let you know that if you have any questions throughout this presentation, we ask that you put those in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. That will um, allow us to be able to address them in the order that they are received and keep track of the questions that we have answered. If we're not able to get to your question, we will definitely share these with our presenter um, after the fact, and we can get back to you uh, with anything that you, anything additional that you may need. Um, additionally, if you do like our webinars or you like what NASMA offers, we invite you to take a look at the North American Invasive Species Management Association's webpage. And we invite you to be either a um, member as an individual or as a partner. Uh, with that said, today's webinar, we have Dia, and we will be discussing the pest risk analysis, which is the process of evaluating biological or other scientific and economic evidence to determine whether a pest should be regulated and the strength of any phytosanitary measure should be taken against it. Our presenter today, as I said, is Dia, and <laughs> I would love to, I, you know what I didn't do, Dia, was get um, how to say your last name. Is it just Lawrence? Uh, it's Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very Midwestern. Very Midwestern. All right. So with that, we'll just have um, Dia take it away. Thank you so much, Dia. Great. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the invitation to do this webinar. Um, I, uh, you know, I started this position at University of Florida about seven years ago, and I didn't even know how to do a risk assessment. Um, and in the past seven years, I've learned a lot about pest risk analysis, risk assessment, and uh, the role that it can play um, in preventing uh, biological invasions. Um, so I'm really excited to share some of the material and some of the new developments that we have um, in, in going on here in Florida at the, at the university uh, with you today. Um, well, let's see. All right, um, so before, before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of this talk, I'd really just like to take a moment and define risk, um, risk for everyone. Um, risk is the combination of likelihood and impact. Um, so if an event can't happen and it can't have an impact, there is no risk. If an event is likely to occur, but it will have, have no impact, then there is no risk. If an event is likely to occur and it will have a, have measurable impacts, then the risk is present. And so this could be applicable to multiple situations and scenarios, but um, I'm sure you can imagine how this could really come into play for um, predicting uh, which species might become our next invaders. Um, to put this in sort of a visual kind of schematic, uh, we, can, we can think of this as a risk matrix. Whereas your, uh, the likelihood that something will happen along the bottom axis um, goes from very low to very high, and the, the, the likelihood that those impacts are going to be great, um, you're going to have measurable impacts goes from very low to very high. Um, you can see the way the changes, uh, the colors change across this matrix, where of course the red is the highest risk and the, and the darkest green is the lowest risk. So now we've defined, um, we've defined uh, risk, and just just kind of keep that in mind as we move through some of these topics. Um, but here's a, a more, an outline for the for the for the talk today. I'm getting some feedback. I don't know if that's mine or. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about broadly about pest risk analysis um, and then move into the program that I oversee at the university, which is the UF IFAS assessment of non-native plants in Florida's natural areas. Um, we call it the IFAS assessment for short. 
Um, and then again, I'm going to talk to you about some of those new developments that um, we have uh, going on here at the, at, at the assessment. Um, but first, we'll talk about what, why, and who, um, some international standards for PRA, and digging deeper into risk assessment. Um, so this is just the, the definition of pest risk analysis um, uh, that uh, was included in the, the abstract for this talk. But, but basically, we're evaluating biological or other um, scientific or economic evidence um, to, to basically determine whether or not a pest should be regulated. So by, by identifying the risk that something is going to become an invader, um, we're determining whether the risk is great enough to apply phytosanitary measures um, to try to prevent that species from arriving. So why do we do PRA? Um, this, this process is usually initiated uh, in one of two ways. Um, the first being uh, that a pathway has been identified. So some new emerging pathway um, has come onto the radar of, of regulators. Um, or a species, uh, specifically the species, uh, has become, been identified as a potential threat. Um, so we, we would initiate PRA based on um, a, a pest that's come on the radar uh, that we would like to identify uh, that risk. And so some examples of new, uh, new and existing pathways, uh, the international trade of species uh, on sites such as eBay or Etsy, um, you can sell, buy or sell just about anything on the internet. Here, uh, I believe it's Giant Salvinia. Um, I recently saw a talk in, uh, in Louisville at the Ecological Society meeting where folks are sharing, uh, buying and selling ants as a new pet. Uh, if you live in an apartment, you can't keep dogs, you can't keep cats. Um, folks are actually keeping ants as pet, pets. Um, and so there's very little regulation or things are slipping under the radar with these ants getting um, sent around the globe. Um, another, another pathway you can think about in terms of commerce, uh, this would be more, um, more under our radar in terms of you know, APHIS, uh, keeping an eye on these uh, imports. So around Valentine's Day, we have millions and millions of stems of flat cut flowers that come into the United States. I would add that most of those come in through Florida. So we would want to identify potential species coming in via that, that pathway. And then finally here, this is a, a species that's really raising a lot of alarms around the country, this spotted lantern fly. This would be an example of a species that came onto our ra radar and we would immediately go into PRA for something like this. Um, so who does PRA? Uh, regional or national plant protection organizations. Uh, this would be, think globally on, on this one. Um, there are 10 regional PPOs. There's one that encompasses North America, um, some in Africa, one across the European Union. Um, here you see EPO on the African logo. Um, and then we have some national PPOs including programs in the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and in the United States, APHIS would be um, our, our plant protection organization here. Um, so there have been efforts through the years to develop international standards for pest risk analysis. Um, so if you've got a whole bunch of different countries and regions doing the same kind of exercise, um, standards really help even if you're not using the same direct process, standards can make sure that if you're meeting the min minimum standards, that, that there's some sort of consistency across these programs. Um, so very basic standards that were developed for, for um, pest risk analysis is that pest, a PRA program should com be comprised of four steps. Um, there should be a very clear initiation. Um, so why are you doing it? Uh, your risk assessment. So this would be when you're actually doing, you know, using your weed risk assessment or your uh, whatever tool you're using to um, characterize the risk of that species. Um, the third element is risk management. Um, so how, how would you manage the risk and can that risk be managed um, to a, a reasonable level that would allow 
the species to be imported or used. Um, and then for risk communication, you communicate your, the results of your risk analysis to your stakeholders. Um, they also determine that all of these, um, all of these risk assessments and uh, risk analysis exercises should un incorporate uncertainty around the predictions um, and they should be transparent. Um, so the, that transparency might be the reports that come out, um, that comes out in your risk communication, um, you're clearly citing your sources and your process. Um, so there are multiple risk assessment tools. Um, they cover multiple taxas. Um, I'm going to focus on plants because that's what I work on. Um, but if you dig deep in the lit um, and look around online, there are tools that can predict, um, you know, invasive fish, um, other uh, aquatic um, uh, vertebrates. Um, so there's different tools out there that you can use, but specifically what I work on is plants. Um, but if you think about a risk assessment tool, um, you want to characterize the risk potential of a species based on the likelihood um, that it will be introduced and it will spread, um, that there will be negative impacts, whether those are ecological, economic, or human health impacts. Uh, I'm assuming everybody on this call is uh, is familiar with invasive species and you know the the national definition of invasive species here in the United States really specifies that there has to be an impact to one of those three elements. Um, and then for these tools, um, risk thresholds are selected using known non-invaders, minor invaders, and major invaders. So if you've got a species, you, you, you've got a tool that you want to determine what those cutoffs are, you're going to put a bunch of species that you already know that invasion status, put them through that tool, and then where those species fall out helps you determine those thresholds. Um, typically, you'll do a certain amount of those species to set the threshold, and then um, another bunch of species that you know their status um, to test the thresholds. If that, I hope that makes sense. Um, the two most commonly used tools in uh, weed risk assessment or plant risk assessment um, is the Australian weed risk assessment and the USDA uh, PPQ WRA. Um, these tools have been tested for accuracy. Uh, I know the AWRA across multiple geographies and uh, they are, they're pretty accurate, uh, around 90 to 97% accuracy at predicting major invaders. Um, so there have also been efforts, you know, the standards that I mentioned before were for the whole process, the pest risk analysis process. Um, but there, there have been efforts to develop minimum standards for risk assessment uh, for the actual tools. Um, and it's important to note at this point that Pets risk analysis will always incorporate risk assessment, but this isn't vice versa. Um, so there are some programs that just do risk assessment, but not in that PRA framework. Um, risk assessment tools uh, will, will vary, and again, they do cover multiple taxa, but if we can develop these and follow these minimum standards, um, that we can ensure consistency in content across the tools um, and, and hopefully across the tax as well, in terms of communicating uh, this risk. Um, so some folks got together in a, a big workshop, uh, determined that there should be 14 minimum standards. Some of those I've already mentioned, your likelihood of establishment, arrival, and impact should be clearly defined. Um, but just a few other, I'm not going to go through all 14, um, but some other standards that they identified um, that you should include the assessment of socioeconomic impacts, um, effects of future climate change, uh, sources should be properly and clearly documented, and there should be some level of quality assurance. Quality assurance being that there's a clear, um, a clear review process. Uh, to make sure that, you know, across different assessors, um, you've got some sort of um, consistency. Consistency. If you want to read more about uh, the minimum standards for risk assessment protocols, 
um, this paper here uh, by Helen Roy and her colleagues. Um, that is available uh, in the Journal of Applied Ecology. Um, so I'm going to move now into what we're doing here at the University of Florida to prevent uh, prevent or um, at least diagnose uh, invaders as early as possible um, here at the university. Uh, but before I get too far into that, I know that this is there, there's a lot of folks who are not in Florida on this um, webinar. Um, so I just to give a, a short background about invasive species here in the state. Um, we have a lot of invasive species in Florida. Um, a lot of it makes the news. We have had, you know, the, the pythons in the Everglades. There's even a television show about ca catching those pythons. Um, so we have a lot of a, a lot of attention um, to our invasive species problem here. Uh, the reason why we have so many species here in the state is because our climate runs from tropical to subtropical as you move south to north. Um, and those, those climates overlap with some of the most biodiverse regions in the world. Um, similarly, um, we are a tourism and trade hotspot. So a lot of people like to come to Florida um, because of our, our, our climate. Um, and then again, our trade, uh, we have the ports of Miami, the port in Tampa, we have one in Jacksonville um, with Miami, the, the photo you see here at the top with these shipping, contain, uh, shipping uh, um, cargo ships with all the containers. There's hundreds and hundreds of those containers on each of the ships and with commodities on the inside. And so there's a very high, um, high likelihood in that those many containers that there's going to be something um, either intentionally or unintentionally introduced from, from that source. Um, similarly, we have millions of uh, tourists that come through our state. We've got, you know, Mickey Mouse, uh, you know, the Disney uh, empire in Orlando uh, that brings a lot of folks internationally. Uh, and the photo at the bottom, are that's another port in Miami with all the cruise ships lined up. Um, so there's just a lot of in, in, in and out activity within Florida um, where we can have those, those introduction events. Um, the last statistic I saw is over 80% of all non-native plants enter the United States through Florida. Um, so that's pretty, pretty huge. Uh, and we also have over 1,400 non-native plant species in our herbarium records here. Uh, important to emphasize that not all of those 1,400 species are invasive, um, but it's just, it's a very large number of non-native uh, plants in our flora. And where we do have invasive uh, plant invasions, um, you're going to see some major ecosystem effects. They're pretty dramatic here. Um, there's changes in water and nutrient cycling. Um, altered disturbance regimes. Uh, this, the photo at the top is a Melaleuca fire in the Everglades area. Um, those trees are full of volatiles that act as almost like a fuel, an additional fuel to the fire. Um, and they are in a fire adapted system that's, you know, typically experiences a, a slow and low fire. Um, but you put these Melaleuca trees and their volatiles and you've got much more intense and fast moving fires, as you can see here. Um, there are increases in resource competition. The photo below is a uh, climbing fern overtopping a uh, native ecosystem. In this case, the, the, the fern climbing up and over the trees, well, they are beating everybody else out for, um, for light uh, in, in, that, in that competition scenario. And the result of all of this is that we end up with a reduction of na native species. And here is a photo of one of the hammocks in the Everglades and all of those neon, that neon looking um, um, plant material in the center of this hammock is, uh, that's that climbing fern. So you can just, I use this to illustrate the scope of one of these invasions um, just, just in the landscape. And as you can imagine, to get in there and try to ma manage this in the, in the middle of the Everglades would be, be quite difficult. 
Um, there are also uh, pretty measurable um, and, and very large <laughs> uh, economic costs to biological invasions here in the state. Um, there are significant impacts to recreation. Uh, the photo of the hydrolet with Coola Springs there, um, you know, our springs are a place where folks like to go paddleboard and tube uh, and go see the manatees. Um, when we have a hydrilla invasion, it might inhibit people's ability to enjoy those springs. Um, but one of the most, I think one of the most dramatic um, examples of economic loss uh, is, is the situation with um, citrus greening. Um, so citrus greening is a disease, bacterial disease that's vectored by um, a psyllid, a non-native psyllid. And um, basically it drop, causes the fruit to drop off the citrus trees and um, not develop properly. Uh, so between 2006 and 2012, it's estimated that this has cost uh, $3.63 billion to our industry and thousands of jobs have been lost as well. Um, but in terms of management and thinking about how much it costs to manage the species, um, you know, just on not natural areas of our state, so our national parks, our state parks, and some of our county, county natural areas, um, it's estimated that $45 million per year is spent just on those acres. That's not the entire state. Um, and you can see that, you know, the top, these are color-coded. The blues are aquatic plants and the greens are terrestrial plants. But just a few species take up the bulk of that $45 million, with hydrilla um, costing almost $10 million per year in control. Um, and there are estimates that that control costs for the whole state could uh, could be over a hundred million dollars per year. Um, and if you'd like to see more information about the um, the economic costs um, in Florida, just on those natural areas, um, there's a paper in um, Conservation Science and Practice that talks about those expenditures and different patterns and how that money was spent across the state. And then the final impact that we're concerned with really is the, um, the health, uh, human health impacts. Um, and in Florida, we have an, uh, about, you know, periodically we have these um, escapes of these giant African land snails. Um, and, you know, I, as far as I know, they're eradicated at this point, but, you know, they, they ebb and flow. Um, this is a snail that's kept as pets um, and, it's it's feared when they do get out that they will be a host for um, for rat lungworm, which could be rather devastating if a human were to get lungworm. Um, in Texas recently, I saw this this news article uh, a few weeks ago where a woman was was killed by a pack of feral hogs. Again, you know that's some pretty dramatic um, human health impacts. Um, but other human health impacts we all know about pollen and and things like that. Um, and then, of course, uh, giant hogweed, the birds associated with that. So uh, invasive species, you know, we, we take it pretty seriously down here. Um, and so this is where the ICAS assessment comes in at the University of Florida. Um, how can we work to try to keep those, um, e either the plants from spreading um, or, or from entering the state? So we have three tools that we use. The first is the predictive tool that we use to evaluate risk uh, before a species enters the state. Uh, in some rare occasions, we do use this tool for uh, in cases where species are gonna be considered for a new use. So think biofuels or biomass planting. Uh, the second tool is the status assessment and we use that to evaluate species that are already present in the state. So this is more to characterize uh, the invasion uh, within, within the state of Florida. And the final tool is the infraspecific taxon protocol. Um, we call it the ITP for short. Um, and we use this to evaluate invasion risk of cultivars, hybrids, those kind of things. And the assessment was created in the late 90s by the Invasive Plant Working Group out of, there was a situation where, you know, we're an extension university, a land grant university, and there were 
faculty members at the university that were recommending planting species while other faculty members were telling folks not to plant them and to kill them. And it was starting to become confusing for the public. Um, so the IFAS assessment was created in 99 to provide consistent recommendations for the use of non-native plants uh, in the state. Um, we're currently fulfilling a research and extension role. In the past, it was more of just that extension piece, uh, but we're doing some research here in the, at the assessment to inform, um, um, to inform risk assessment you know, around the world. So we have some pretty interesting projects that, that, that we're working on. Um, and we've been recognized nationally and internationally. I've done some consulting with um, different programs around the United States and, um, and internationally. Um, so uh, we'll just briefly go through each of these tools. Um, our predictive tool is based on the Australian risk assessment. Um, this is one of the most widely, broadly used tool, risk assessment tools for plants uh, on the planet. Uh, we modified this one for Florida by just changing a few questions um, we, specifically about the climate, uh, the soil type, and the precipitation. Um, we evaluate, again, the species that are new to the state. Uh, typically, we know that they cause problems elsewhere, so there's a reason why we're, we're doing that risk assessment. Um, and then species that are proposed for a new use uh, in those rare occasions. Uh, we have over 200 species that we evaluated. Uh, those reports are available on our website. Um, so you, uh, when you go to our website, you can do different filters. One of those filters, you can click the tool and just see um, the species that we've done those for. If you go to that species page, um, you can click on the report and download the report. Um, this risk assessment, the predictive tool, is a series of 49 questions. Um, and based on the domestication, climate, um, and weediness elsewhere, um, th that's considered more of those historic, uh, history and biogeographic questions. Um, this, the rest of the questions kind of fall into this life history and ecology um, subsection. So what kind of plant is it? How does it reproduce? Um, and, and what are those dispersal mechanisms? Um, so each question is answered with typically with a yes or no answer. There are a couple that you enter a number, um, but generally they're yes or no questions. Um, and depending on how you answer the question, it gets a score. Uh, and typically those scores are run from a negative one to a positive one. Um, but there are a few questions like, uh, is it an, a known environmental weed elsewhere? Um, that one actually gets weighted a little higher. So you know that question might get a four. Um, but again, I mentioned earlier that, you know, these things, these tools are tested and uh, thresholds are set. In this case, a score of less than one is a low risk for invasion. A one to six is an evaluate further or moderate risk. Uh, and greater than six is a high risk for invasion. Um, we do use a secondary screening tool for the one to six species. Um, and I would be happy to talk to anyone after after this, if, uh, if you would like more details on that. Okay, moving into the second tool, um, this is our status assessment. And again, this is species that are already in the state of Florida. And you see the map here is divided into three segments, the north, the central, and the south zone. Um, this is, we do provide um, recommendations that might differ for one species. You might not be okay to plant in the north, because we have a frost line up there. Um, but in tropical South Florida, it might be very problematic. So it is possible for one species to have multiple conclusions. Um, but we, we like to gather information to describe the status of the species based on ecological impacts, um, potential for expanded distribution, management dif difficulty, and any economic value. Um, we have five to 600 species in our database that have been evaluated with this tool because we like to keep, you know, if something's a caution this year, well, we might, we, we want to characterize that invasion um, and we can only do that if we reassess that species. So we, we uh, reassess caution species every two years 
uh, and okay species, the ones that are we deem to be non-invasive at this time, every 10 years. Um, and to do that, we incorporate field data from our experts. So I have a, a relationship with quite a few land managers across the state who are very generous with their time and um, provide the data we use um, to answer some of these questions, specifically questions about management difficulty and the impacts they're seeing across the landscape. Uh, the third tool is the infraspecific taxon protocol. And this again is for cultivars, varieties, and subspecies. Um, we want to make sure that the recommendations for the resident species, um, we, we want to determine if the, the recommendations uh, for the resident species apply. So that, that parent material, um, if it's an invasive parent um, or resident, uh, we really, to, to pass, uh, to, to pass a species through this tool, we need to, to know that it's not going to be as invasive as the parent. Um, to do this uh, tool, typically this is an, in, uh, an internal process uh, that has been, been written into our cultivar release process for, um, for the university. A request is submitted to the IP assessment staff, um, and then we, we basically compile the data and look through the data that they, they provide in their research uh, to determine whether it's distinct from the parent and that it's going to behave differently, specifically looking for sterility uh, and that those, those species will not hybridize. Uh, the top species here, Ruelia simplex, um, this stuff is all over um, some of the natural areas in uh, definitely around Gainesville um, and up into North Florida. Um, so the, the Department of Environmental Horticulture has developed quite a few sterile cultivars of, of Aurelia. And you can see the, the, the wild type is very spindly. Um, the flowers are kind of a light purple. Um, this improved cultivar is more lush. Uh, the, the flowers are, you know, a little more striking. Um, and so the other important thing to note here is that that Mayan purple is also sterile and it was um, very clearly um, shown that it does not hybridize. Um, the cultivars for this Ruelia species are listed as cautions in our database um, because, you know, you can keep the, the seeds from spreading, uh, but these, these plants do spread uh, vegetatively. Um, so we determined that it was okay to recommend only if you manage, uh, manage that, that vegetative spread. Um, the bottom, the Lantana uh, camera, uh, this is another widespread invader in Florida. Um, these things put off pretty decent, you know, fruit production, fecundity. Um, and the Bloomify red next to it, that, that's a sterile cultivar that does not spread below ground. Um, so this one is actually a green. Um, all of our, our recommendations are color-coded red light, yellow light, green light. So this one is green, meaning uh, this is okay to recommend. Um, the, the sterility of this, you don't get those fruits. Um, that parent lantana, um, you know, the fruits are widely dispersed by, by birds across the landscape. Um, so you can assess our database at the IFAS assessment website at assessment.ifas.ufl.edu, um, where you can access conclusions for about 900 species. And again, I mentioned you can filter those by conclusion, you can filter by the zone, um, what the growth form is, what tool we use. Um, those filtered lists you can download and into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so now I'm going to move into um, some of the new developments that we have here, um, some projects, ongoing projects, and some things I've been thinking about um, at the IFAS assessment. Um, First, I mentioned earlier this PPQ WRA. Um, we, were, we were awarded a Farm Bill um, award to work with APHIS um, to, to look at the PPQ WRA model um, and whether it's a, a good tool to be added to um, the IFAS assessment toolbox. Um, this tool is based on the AWRA. Um, it retains many of the original questions. 
It does remove some questions that are unimportant or difficult to answer. Um, I should clarify the unimportant, meaning they did, uh, the researchers did uh, sensitivity analysis, and the ones that were less less impactful to the final score were were um, were left behind. Um, but roughly, it's 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 the same information as the AWRA. Um, but what I really like about this tool is that it divides your risk prediction into two elements. Um, so you have an impact uh, and an establishment and spread element. Um, if you look at the graph, you can see all those little X's, um, circles and triangles. Um, again, I mentioned before that you know thresholds are set by putting known major, minor, and non-invaders. And so based on the, the validation of this tool, that's where those species fell out. Um, the other great thing about this tool is it does incorporate uncertainty, which um, brings us closer to the IPPC international standards. Uh, and there are also geopotential models, so you get a nice um, visualization of potential distribution of, of the species in question. And so here you can see, and forgive me, I took these screenshots a while ago. I can't remember which species these this is, um, but you can see the red, yellow, and green um, um, tested species, those major, minor, and non-invaders. Um, and the black uh, square is where the score falls out for the species that was evaluated. Um, and you can see the, again, the, um, the establishment and spreads potential score and the impact potential score. Um, basically, a, you know, the spreadsheet that you use, this tool, um, will complete a logistic re regression to place your point into this, um, this framework. Um, in this case, the species is a high risk for invasion. Um, the uncertainty, uh, you can see the box around that point. Um, essentially, for every question you answer in this tool, you're assigning a level of uncertainty from negligible to maximum. And uh, with that, there's an uncertainty analysis that, that is run at the end of the risk assessment, where it uses Monte Carlo simulations um, to, to change that yes or no based on the level of your uncertainty. So if your uncertainty is high, it's going to change your, your answer more times. If, you're, if your uncertainty is negligible, it's not going to change it. So it runs these um, Monte Carlo simulations thousands of times, and you can see the result here. Um, the black dots are outliers from those multiple simulated models. Um, and then each one of these squares is a different confidence interval um, around your prediction. And ideally, you want a small square around your predict prediction. That means, um, you know, your uncertainty is relatively low. Um, and then we have our geopotential models. Uh, we've been working with, um, with PPQ, um, the Paralab, with Tony Coop and his team, um, on these geopotential models, and um, what we've done is added the uncertainty to this element as well. Um, so this is uh, Polonia, uh, a geopotential model for Polonia. And what you can see here is uh, the little counties that have the slashes through them. Those are uh, points that are already in uh, the United States. Um, the darkest red is uh, where we're quite certain Polonia can, can, can live. Um, and as you move to the lighter pink, um, well, it's not quite, you're kind of looking at the outer edges of the, um, the potential distribution. Um, so we're pretty excited about adding this element uh, specifically to the X assessment because um, we didn't have any map mapping um, in our program. Um, I'll also add that this, showing the two split uh, the two split graphs uh, behind the geopotential model um, here, those are actually incorporated. This is an older version of um, the tool. Um, I just like to keep it this way when I'm explaining the two elements of, uh, of the risk assessment. Um, but now the, the newer risk assessments from, from the, the USDA will have those overlaid on one another. 
Um, so the pros for the Australian model is that it's simple. Um, it's widely used uh, across the, the globe. Um, it does require no additional software and it only takes you know a day or two to complete. I think the estimate, if you get really good at it, is about eight hours. Um, PPQWRA has a risk prediction that's more descriptive um, and it does incorporate that uncertainty. The cons for the AWRA is that um, those results are presented as a simple score. Um, this isn't as good for um, isn't as good for risk communication. Um, the pro up above in the PPQWRA by separating those scores, it's really helpful in, in communicating to folks, you know, just why something is a high risk. Um, the con for the AWRA, uh, again, we don't have uncertainty in this model, um, and it does identify major invaders more accurately than the non-invaders. So, you know, the accuracy for non-invaders is, you know, they're meaning there's more false positives. And then, the con for the PPQWRA is that it's not as universally familiar. Um, I will add, though, that different groups are starting to pick this, uh, pick this model up. Um, so I would see this changing in the future. Um, but there is more of a learning curve to complete these assessments. Um, and to do those uh, geopotential models, it does require ArcGIS. Uh, and the uncertainty analysis is done in a program called um, At Risk. Um, moving forward to another project that I'm very passionate about, um, we're, we're in the middle of a horizon scan um, to, to identify invasive species threats to Florida. Um, so what is a horizon scan? Um, this is a, a systematic examination of information um, in an effort to identify potential threats, risks, emerging issues, opportunities, um, typically to inform policy regulations and decision making. Um, this is used a lot in business. It's used a lot in medicine, pharmaceutical companies, um, but it's just starting to be um, used for natural resources uh, and environmental purposes. Um, but broadly, and probably you know, breaking it down to the nuts and bolts of it, it's really the best guess to identify what is unknown. Um, so the horizon scan that we're doing here in Florida, um, basically, it's based on this project that was led up by, um, had, had, headed by Helen Roy, um, where they did a horizon scan um, for non-native species threats in um, Great Britain. Uh, so I saw her give, us, give a talk at a national meeting, um, talked to her a little bit afterwards, uh, really started thinking about this. And um, like, you know, we, we need to be doing this in Florida. If we're getting, you know, we have all these invaders, we're getting the majority of the non-native plants coming through our state and all, all the potential intentional and unintentional introductions. This is something that could really be, be helpful, especially when you consider that most of the risk assessments and risk analysis that we do, you know, it's for species that we have some idea it's coming or we, ha we, ha we have some idea um, that it, it's a threat beforehand. Um, so this might help us get really ahead of the, the curve here. Um, so one of the things that we're gonna do or we're in the process of doing with this horizon scan is identifying pathways. Um, so there are some emerging pathways. Um, you know, I mentioned those ants before. Here you can see these test tubes. Those are, you know, ant, how ants have been shipped. Um, you know, or they'll put them in a tube, a pregnant queen, she can live up to five months with no food. Um, so these are potential, I didn't know about that pathway until last summer. So I'm like really fascinated by this ants as pets thing. Um, but other new, new pathways might include ship, new shipping routes, uh, maybe more broadly as, you know, the ice caps recede, we've got openings of, of shipping routes, um, new kinds of packing material, and of course tourism will always be an issue. And so what we want to do is identify those new pathways and add those into the old pathways and rank those in an order of concern. Um, and then the actual species list that we want to um, develop 
Uh, our goal is to identify invasive species threats, um, you know, things that are likely to be introduced to Florida in the next 10 years. So we really wanted, you know, one of the first things we did in our workshop was identify that um, time scale. Um, so it's a five, or I'm sorry, four point, four part process um, with the organ organizational and explore, exploratory phase, consultation between experts, review, and our final phase. Um, so basically, we've done the organizational phase. Uh, we're, we've got our lists set up. Um, and we've moved into this consultation between experts. We divided our teams into marine with vertebrate, invertebrate, and plants. Um, our plant team looks at terrestrial and aquatic, vertebrates, terrestrial and aquatic, and our inverts. We actually have um, added a fifth group. So we've there were so many species in the invertebrate group to consider that we're gonna have an aquatic and a terrestrial invertebrate group. Um, we started with about 9,000 species. We looked, we used um, CABI's horizon scanning tool to develop our initial list, and we're adding and subtracting from that. Next, we're gonna move into um, rapid risk assessments where we're, you know, think about some of, if you have any experience in risk assessments, um, this one, instead of taking a week, or eight hours, we want these done in about an hour. So we're literally just looking at likelihood of introduction, establishment, and likelihood that there will be measurable environmental, socioeconomic, or human health impacts. Um, each scoring element, each risk element um, is, they can be scored between one and five um, with a maximum score of 125 points. Folks are adding, um, they're, they're adding their uncertainty to each of those scores and an overall uncertainty and quick synopsis um, in, uh, next to their final score. They're also identifying the pathways for each of those species. Um, these scores will be used for initial rankings and this tool was modified from that Helen Roy um, project. With her uh, blessing, um, she helped me sort of tweak it for, for our purposes. Um, and here's just a shot of the group. We had 30 folks that showed up for the initial um, workshop. Um, right now we're conducting our, our risk assessments. Um, we had folks from Canada and all over the United States and a really nice showing across Florida. Um, it was a really great group. We had a good time. We worked through, I don't know if you've ever workshopped anything, but, um, you know, sometimes it can get a little, you know, people have certain ideas. So it was really a good exercise for me personally in terms of facilitating a group. Um, and I look forward to uh, the next steps with that. Um, and so just to summarize the whole, the whole kit and caboodle here, um, pest risk analysis and risk assessments are, it's important to recognize that they're vital components in um, invasive species prevention. Um, it's also very important to remember that there are many tools available and uh, it's unlikely there will be one universal tool and that stands for status assessment kind of screening tools and risk predictive school, uh, tools. Um, but minimum standards can ensure consensus and content across, uh, you know, if, if I'm using Australian weed risk assessment and somebody else is using PPQ, you know, if we're doing the same kinds of things, we can still uh, communicate that risk very similarly. Um, the IFAS assessment strives to prevent new invasions and limit the spread of current invaders here in Florida. Um, and we're currently engaged with, you know, I've really been reaching out nationally and internationally, picking up on some of these new ideas and innovations in invasive species prevention. Um, and I think this is what is really going to help us stay ahead of the invasion curve. Um, and here are just some shots of some of the most beautiful things I can think about in Florida. You know, there's this, uh, a pretty pristine spring. You can go down there at 72 degrees all year round. Um, River of Grass, the Everglades, and this bottom is a shot of the Apalachicola National Forest and the Panhandle. Um, we have gorgeous natural areas here and, you know, it's my passion, my, my mission to try to do what I can to keep those as pristine as possible. Um, I, we do have opportunities for collaboration. Um, we're offering a week-long work, workshop to train users how to implement this PPQ WRA model. We're shooting for the end of May for this. Um, 
you know, this would be modeled off of their um, WRA 101 class they were, they used to offer on, uh, I'll be developing the content for that with Tony Coop. Um, currently working with Georgia EPSI to develop a semi-quantitative screening tool to aid in the listing of non-native plants. So Georgia does not have a noxious um, weed list or any kind of um, regulatory list. So um, a lot of folks and, and managers are using the Georgia EPSI plant list um, to justify management plans and prioritize species. So basically we're working on coming up with a pretty easy tool that they can use to, to rank their, you know, give at least give a score and think about um, why certain species are on certain lists in Georgia. If this works out, I'd like to expand that across um, you know, other states in the Ipsys and Epsys so that maybe someday we can have some sort of, um, you know, uh, continuity across state borders when it comes to the listing process. Um, the consensus building portion of the Horizon Scan project should, uh, we're, we're set to, our timeline looks like about uh, sometime in August um, to get those lists out. So we'll start having products out of that process uh, this summer. Um, and I'll just leave this up here. Again, the IPS assessment website. And if you have any questions, that's my email address. Um, if questions that we don't get to here. Um, but but with that, I'm, I'm ready to take your questions. All right, thank you so much, Dia. This is some good stuff. So uh, we do have uh, Paul asking or commenting as well, saying that he'd be glad to see climate change being included as a standard element of risk assessments. Is there any standardization emerging for what future time frame of projected climate conditions should be considered? Yeah, you know, this is something I'm just starting, I'm dipping my toe in. And I've, I've seen, you know, and what we've talked about here is, is um, just how the assessment's going to start doing this is um, those, those biogeographic, you know, maps, um, I'm sorry, the geopotential maps. So if we're projecting in the future with climate change, um, we were thinking 25, 50, and 100 years. Um, but again, I'm just getting started in this part of it. Um, and I don't think that there's any, any real standardization of um, at least the United States yet. And if there is, let me know, because that would be helpful for my program. All right. The next question is, has Florida considered a regional horizon scan in addition to its state scan, such that you're assessing potential invaders to the entire region? So region as in like the Southeast, I would guess. Um, uh, probably. Okay. Um, <laughs> so what I'd like to say, so this horizon scan basically, you know, it was, I read a paper and I saw a talk, a 20 minute talk and um, was like, we're gonna try this out. So for me, this horizon scan is a test. And um, basically the reason why we separated, the, the way that they did it in Europe was, you know, everything happened, all of the risk assessments and, and list building happened before they got together. And the workshop that they had was the consensus building. And the way that I structured this was to bring everybody to the table as we developed our process. And so I went in with a different idea how I was going to do the risk, uh, you know, the, the rapid risk screening. Um, we we had we modified our um, our list building, um, things like that. So, you know, by bringing everybody to the table at the beginning, we were setting up our framework to conduct these things in the United States. And my hope is that after we finish this one, that I can go help other regions um, conduct these, whether, you know, I think it gets a little dif difficult to think too broadly in um, scale um, geographically, um, but, but I think that there would be ways to modify our process to cover the southeastern United States or east of the Mississippi, um, or to to pare it down to something like you know you know maybe we're doing a horizon scan of potential invaders from the horticulture industry. All right, we do have another question. 
does the risk assessment tool have a way to determine which vectors might be most likely to introduce species? So I'm going to guess um, uh, if it were the, I'm, I'm trying to think if this is, the question is um, geared towards the full risk assessment or the rapid risk assessment for the horizon scan. If it, the tools themselves don't have, really have a way to, you know, the scoring is not going to tell you um, which, gosh, how to answer this. It's not going to tell you which um, pathway just through running the, the tool, um, which one is the most likely. But I think through the expert knowledge and, you know, I've had some conversations about whether or not there are ways to automate some of these risk assessment processes. And I, you know, ruffles my fe feathers to think about that because there's, there's a certain, there's a definite human element to conducting these risk assessments, whether it's the hour long rapid risk assessment to a full time, you know, European pe pest plant organiz organization, you know, they write a report and sit in a room for a week to finish theirs with, with a panel of experts. You have to have the expert eyes, um, whether that is an expert specifically with the plant or an expert with the process um, to really decipher um, those results. Um, but with the, if the question was about the horizon scanning project, um, we will be ranking, um, you know, when we enter the pathways for the species, we're ranking them in order that we, the assessor thinks they're likely. And then we also have that, like, you know, for all of these, there is a likelihood of um, a rival score. So it's kind of built in, but it's not maybe as clear. Um, and again, you need that the, the expert eyes to be able to, to put that. And I guess this is where the risk communication comes in as well. If you're writing up your report at the end, um, you know, you're going to have, a, there's going to be a discussion of pathways. And they're even doing this on CABI species pages. You know, there's a pathways section. So I hope that answered the question. I don't see a follow up, but I do see <laughs> that we have probably one last question for the time that we do have remaining. It says, is there any regulatory authority associated with the risk assessments? How are PRA results utilized by regulatory authorities or agencies? So we'll start small, small and then work our way out. Um, the risk assessment process that I do here in the state of Florida um, is non-regulatory, except um, we are written into the biomass planting rule. Um, so when folks are getting permitted to do, um, say, they want to plant 100 acres of bamboo for whatever reason, um, they have to come get a weed risk assessment. You know, FDAX comes to me, I do, that's the Department of Ag, I do a risk assessment and then they take that into consideration whether or not they're going to give them a, a permit. Um, they also, on a state level, use our risk assessments to determine listing plants. So the beach vitex risk assessment was used to determine whether or not they were going to list beach vitex on the noxious weed list. That should have, they voted yes, that it's going to be listed. Um, it just hasn't made it through legislator yet. Um, on a national level with the United States, um, pest risk analysis, uh, at least as far as I know, with Tony's group or with the Peril group up in Raleigh, um, they, uh, they do use the risk analysis process in helping determine whether species will be added to the federal noxious weed list. And then internationally, um, I would say internationally, it's used much more internationally than in the United States. So I know uh, Canada's got a product, um, um, they're using risk analysis now, Ireland, um, like I said, the European Union, Australia probably was one of the innovators in, in, this, in this effort. Awesome. Well, this is some really good stuff, and we appreciate you taking the time today to, to share um, all of this good information with us. And we definitely appreciate everyone who took the time to 
um, attend the webinar and listen to all the great work that you're doing. But with that, it puts us at uh, 2 p.m. Central. Um, and I believe that is our time for the day. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And thank you, Dia, for providing us all this great info. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. This was great. All right. If you do have any follow-up uh, questions, please feel free to contact Dia or uh, come through the NASMA page. Thank you all very much and enjoy your afternoon.